Joining us again on the agenda in the summer tonight is Alex Haddad. He's been with us all this week and will join us again tomorrow night. Last night, we discussed how our approach to health concerns might need a rethink. Tonight, we turn a lens to the new tools that are available to the healthcare system and how these technologies could change the future of healthcare. Hi again. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I want to start tonight, Alex, with a clip from YouTube. This is a video we're going to show that offers tips on changing the bed of a bedridden person for caregivers. Take a look at this. When caring for your loved one, um, when they're in the bed, if they need to be changed or to assist them with rolling, here are some techniques. What you'll want to do is have them bend up their knees, okay, and then have them reach across their body roll okay of course if you have a hospital bed you would want the rail to be up so that they wouldn't roll too far also um, you want the bed to be as high as possible so that you're not leaning yourself over you want to be at a work good working height okay Alex it's almost like an instructional video of, of how, how to do this I'm wondering what kind of role can such videos like this play in our health well, system? I wish I had had this when I was a medical student <laughs> nobody taught me I went to university almost for 20 years and nobody taught me how to move a, per a person who is bedridden hmm. appropriately or even less how to educate a caregiver on how to do it so I think this clip is is giving us many lessons okay? one that um, we can use technology to learn from experts on how to do this so I can fill my own gaps as a health professional. In fact, I use these videos to learn myself how to do things and I prescribe them to caregivers. The second is that it's highlighting the importance of other health professionals as part of the team. You see, that person wasn't a physician. He was a physical therapist, probably. Okay? And the third is that there are huge gaps that we have left in terms of meeting the needs of the population and the needs of caregivers is a big one and 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 caregivers for example in canada it's estimated that probably one of every five adults is looking after somebody else in in the majority women average age 45 employed mm. okay, who have kids and probably a spouse or parent to to look after uh, with very little support very little support from the system. And when we look at series of studies on the well-being of caregivers, we are horrified to see that at least 50% of them are experiencing chronic diseases as 50, a result. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, as a result of looking after a loved one. So uh, a lot of the burden of care is falling on the shoulders of this group that I would like to call the largest invisible minority. There is no gender equity here, unfortunately. And, uh, and we are creating yet another group of, of chronic disease sufferers. And we need to do something very urgently. In Canada, I think we estimate that they contribute the equivalent to $80 billion a year in unacknowledged and recognized, you see, labor. uncompensated labor. But not only labor, it's labor of love. And they are being punished for loving somebody else so much. So those are the types of people that could use, you know, the instructional video that appears on YouTube. People are also turning to websites, things like Wikipedia and Patients Like Me, um, for all kinds of things. And I'm wondering, where do those sorts of things, Patients Like Me, Wikipedia, where do they sort of fit in uh, where, for people to share their medical stories and tips? Where does that fit into the, the bigger picture? It fits beautifully in, in what we need. Uh, you see, uh, before all these technologies, we go back in time, even before physicians existed as a profession. Uh, we relied a lot on our own ability to learn how to deal with our health problems. We relied on each other. We relied on our neighbors. We relied on our friends. We relied on our community. These technologies now are allowing us to do that on steroids. Now I can access somebody in a completely different part of the world who has a problem which is very similar to mine. And that's what patients like me do. Uh, you contribute some of your information and the system allows you to find somebody with whom you could compare notes and, and get tips and, and figure out how to deal with your own challenges. At uh, Facebook, we just completed a study of over 600 groups on Facebook just devoted to breast cancer, over 600 with Jackie Bender, a colleague. And what we discovered is that half of them were developed by kids on behalf of all the people living with with, with breast cancer, and that in 7% of cases, those groups were devoted to providing support. Um, we, we have now tremendous support. Wikipedia, you see, is a fantastic resource, even though we are scared of it, because mainly we cannot control it. 
uh, it's, it's a fantastic resource and there are organizations like Cancer Research UK uh, that are taking uh, uh, the responsibility to fix any information that may be incorrect there. But there, I, I learned genetics, for example, from Wikigenetics and this is a, a resource on the web created by parents of kids with rare conditions. And they have produced the best body of knowledge on genetics probably in the world with very little intervention from the formal establishment. So we are seeing an, an, an amazing uh, renaissance of public empowerment and, and the public looking for solutions to meet their needs that I think we should embrace as the, as the health system. Okay, if Wikipedia and patients like me and Facebook and all the other sites that are out there on the internet are so good, how come when I go to my GP, they don't promote things like that? Because we're scared of that. So uh, first of all, uh, email uh, happened after I graduated uh, as, as a tool that I could use with the public uh, from medical school. Uh, in fact, I, I, I had the fortune of starting exchanging email messages with patients in 1991. There was a professor who was a patient who said, can I send you an email mm. about, uh, about my pain problem? And I said, sure. And I didn't know what to do with it. And ever since, I've been interacting with patients through email. But I'm not rewarded by the system to do it. In fact, we're scared because it could ruin our lives. There, are, there is no etiquette. There is no financial compensation in most places to use it. Um, uh, whatever is done there stays there. So, so we may be facing uh, very high levels of, of, of liability, okay, risk. Um, and, uh, and somehow, uh, email, Facebook, uh, threatens our power base, you see. So, so we may feel that we are losing the control to which we, we think uh, we, should, we should have. I bet, though, for most people, if they go to their GP, their GP is going to say to them, yeah, Wikipedia patients like me, sites like that, they're not accurate. We can't control that. They're not accurate. Well, um, and I can respect that, that position, but when we have been studying this, what we have discovered, and this was published a few years ago, is that groups of patients with 500 to 600 have enough of a critical mass to self-correct information and to, and to make sure that pieces of knowledge that may be harmful are flagged. And, uh, and what is fascinating is that the research shows that, uh, for example, 99% of the content on some of these groups is accurate, and that the 1% that is inaccurate, most of it can be fixed within hours by the same members. And remember, I could have a chronic disease. I'm a physician. I could be a member of those groups, and I could be an asset. I could be a resource for other patients. And, and I, it's very important, Pia, for you to understand that if you're living with a chronic disease, you become an expert. You become an expert. And uh, so you can become a mentor for health professionals. A lot of my patients teach me more about their problems than I have ever learned from books, from lectures, from my colleagues, or, or from what I would ever be able to learn, because they can share with me some of their experiences, you see, living with, with one or more diseases, because now we are facing a big problem, which is polypathology. 50% of people with chronic diseases have two or more. There are people who are living with five, six, seven diseases at the same time. Yeah. And we are not prepared for that either. So we are walking on uncharted territory, and the only way in which we can start making sense of it is by learning from each other. And technologies can help us do a lot of that. I want to keep with the theme of technology. I want to pull up some photos here, Alex. Take a look at these. What are we looking at here in the monitor? What we're looking at here is at the lab at the Center for Global Health Innovation. This is a facility in downtown Toronto that we built with support from the Canada Foundation for Innovation and what was called at the time the Ontario Innovation Trust and contributions from the University Health Network and the University of Toronto. And what we have there, in essence, is like a movie set, like this one where we can invent the future. So we can imagine, what if our consulting rooms work differently? Or in this case, what if a very sophisticated machine, and this is an artificial kidney, okay, and this is a colleague, Chris Chan, with his team, and Joe Cafaso and, and our team at the center, asked, what if patients were able to clean their blood by themselves, hemodialysis, when they had kidneys that don't, don't work, and they could do it at home by themselves while they were sleeping? Imagine that. So at the center, we could create a bedroom. Uh, we could invite people to guide us through this process. And together, we reinvented and recreated you see, uh, the management of a very complex disease 
outside the traditional environment so, for better results. So it keeps people from having to go into the hospital to get their dialysis and so on and so forth. I'm wondering that when you talk to patients about this possibility, about them taking more control over their own health care, how do they react? Well, in two ways or more, but at least two big ones that I would like to highlight today. So some people say, sure, I want <laughs> to do it, and provided that you change the preposition to with. Let's do it with each other. Uh, the other, and this is starting to happen more and more. People are saying, mm, we have a financial crisis. The healthcare system is unaffordable. Are you going to dump things on me? Yeah. And, uh, and we need to pay attention to that because the risk is real. Our emphasis on self-management can be, you see, um, exaggerated. And, and we may end up doing more harm than good. So, so we need to be careful. So, it can be embraced or it can be rejected as two extremes, and we have seen every other possibility in the middle. What about healthcare professionals? Because it really is handing over the reins of power a little bit to the patient. How do they react to this? I would say most health professionals would be okay if the outcomes of the patients were equivalent or better, and that happens in many cases. And two, if they were not penalized, if they were not penalized financially or if they were not penalized in terms of recognition, if they are also part of the process. Here we are not talking about replacing the human component is rethinking it. You see, it's re-imagining uh, our roles. You see, what's the essence of a physician today? It's not clear. You see, it's not what it was 50 years ago, I can tell you. But they may not be getting penalized, but they also wouldn't be getting, you know, money if you're doing your own, if the patient's doing their own dialysis. So that seems to be a bit of a detriment for healthcare well, professionals. Well, but if I have more time to listen to my patients and I don't have to rush a consultation, okay? If I, if I don't need to spend five to six minutes just to, to collect the same fee I would collect if I had one hour, then we may be able to start doing some other things that we are absolutely convinced we should be doing, but that are very difficult to do today. So there's no fear of embracing new technology? Of course we are afraid of technology. I'm afraid of technology because throughout our history of humans, we have been incredibly good at turning a tool into a weapon. And these information and communications technologies can become tools of mass self-destruction. Okay. So we need to figure it out together. The key word here, you see, is together. The key preposition is with. Okay. We need to do it with each other because we really don't have answers. We have opportunities and we have risks. And the more we embrace them and explore them together, I think the more likely it would be for us at least not to have regret. Okay, we just have a few minutes left, but I want to bring up one more uh, uh, photo here. This is a Skype video, Alex, that we're going to look at. Tell me the story behind this Skype call. Well, um, I am Colombian by birth, um, so I'm Canadian-Colombian, and on Sundays we tend to have video conferences with our families. So on a, on a Sunday I was talking with my brother, and then that kid who is there on the left came, elbowed my brother out. She was 12. <laughs> That's my niece, Nicole, and she had her sister, who was a baby at the time, and she said, uncle, uncle, I'm very worried about her. I said, what's, what's wrong? I said, well, I'm worried because I think that her belly button is not right. They didn't do a good job <laughs> when she was born. I want you to tell me uh, that if it is wrong and what to do about it. I said, show it, show it to me. And she just put her closer to the camera. And that's what, what's happening right there at that time. And I looked at it and I said, it looks very good to me. And she was disappointed at the beginning. She said, how come? I said, yes, it's OK. And she said, oh, I said, well, you should feel happy about it. The job was well done. So relax, enjoy, love your sister. I'm very happy that you love her so much. But the important thing about this is that this kid, who is 12, used a tool that for her is normal, in this case, Skype. And it was absolutely natural for her to talk to a health professional across thousands of kilometers and to try to satisfy a need. She had an information need that was unmet. And she used this tool. And the tool was never noticed by her while we are still struggling within the health system to figure out how to use the telephone. Okay? So it's a huge gap that is creating huge tension, especially with that generation of kids, for whom it would be absolutely impossible you see, to conceive that you have to go to a doctor to get a normal lab test result. You, you say we struggle with the telephone, but in Ontario we have telehealth. I've used it before. Yeah, you pick but up can the you phone? call your family doctor? No. Uh, no, but I can get medical advice over the okay, phone. Okay, but if you need your family doctor, can you call him or her? Could you access your health record now? I bet you can access your bank statement on, on your smartphone. Okay? And then we have a problem. So yes, you can call uh, 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 any of these telehealth 
services that are telephone operated, but if you need to have personalized care with your team, there is no connection. But is it the, uh, the first step in a better path, something like that? Sure, but that's old hat. That's using the telephone that we invented, what, 100 years ago, probably near here. Okay? So what happens with the use of video of this kind? We don't need, for most cases, sophisticated infrastructure that would help us, you see, solve our problems by going to a dedicated facility with firewalls and all that. There are many, many issues. And in fact, I could claim that there are lots of cases, like my niece, she was distressed by what, by what was happening. And she could solve that problem using a tool that is, for practical purposes, free and widely available. Okay, Alex, you're going to have to give me your Skype number. I'll call it when I have a medical problem. It's a hadat and for any viewer too. <laughs> Perfect. It will ring. I promise you that. Thanks for our conversation tonight. My pleasure.